rest of the day, the rest of the week, and just let him hear your word for it's him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I want to share with you something that happened to me about three years ago. Well, just over three years ago. It was Valentine's Day 2016. I got a text from my mum saying, call me when you get a chance. I'd love to catch up with you. You might think nothing of that, but I knew that when I received that text, it meant something had actually happened and my mum was really urgently needing to speak to me. Amanda and I were just about to sit down for a meal and because she knows me well enough, she said, look, Make that call now, otherwise you're not going to be able to rest for the rest of the evening. So I rang my mum. She told me that the doctors had said to her she wouldn't be able to drive again, and she offered me her car. Both my mum and I and Amanda, we all knew that I would need a car once I finished college, as I started my curacy. Being in the middle of of the, the Yorkshire Dales, there's not much transport. But it was with mixed emotion that I accepted that offer. I was thinking how great it was that I had a car that had been given to me, but how sad it was that my mum would never drive again. A week or so after this, my mum was admitted to the hospice. I'd gone to visit with the family, and when I got home, I got a telephone call from my sister. She told me that as I drove down the driveway from the hospice, My niece had said, Mummy, why is Uncle Tim driving Grandma's car? My sister replied along the lines of, well, Grandma can't drive anymore because she's poorly and Uncle Tim needs a car. To which my niece replied, well, he's done well out of this, hasn't he? (laughs) (laughs) No, (laughs) out of the mouth of babes and all that. She was about six at the time as well, which makes it even better. Now, sh- <laughs> shortly after this had all happened, sadly, my mum did pass away. Once we'd sorted out the assets and my mum's estate was divided between the si- siblings and we received our inheritance, I quickly learned that the car that my mum had given me so kindly was actually not suitable for what I needed. It was a very small car only had three doors, and I realized I'd be transporting people, I'd need a five-door car. So I used the car that my mum had given me as a deposit for a new one. I used part of my inheritance as that deposit for something new. Now for us in our world, inheritance is usually money, or property, or something that we can change into money. My mum's house is still in the name of the estate, we haven't sold it yet. But of course, I've just said the word sold, haven't I? It will become money. There's also, when we talk about inheritance, those sentimental things that we don't want to get rid of, we want to hold on to forever. I have a Bible that my mum used to use that's old and battered, but I treasure that possession. So inheritance can also be those possessions that we don't want to transfer into money. And in the ancient world, particularly in Jewish culture, When there was an inheritance, it was of land. And it was the land that was passed down to the next generation. But the land wasn't to be sold. It was to be kept in the family. Now that harks back to Exodus in many ways, doesn't it? The basic inheritance that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was the land of Canaan. Throughout the years of slavery in Egypt, the promise of the inheritance of the land would have kept the Israelites going. And as we hear of the Israelites leaving Egypt, they were free to go and claim their inheritance. Of course, we know they don't go straight away, but they wander around and around the desert for 40 years, led by the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. But even in that wandering, the presence of God is with them. It was their guarantee that they would get to their final destination. And of course, we know They do. Paul tells some of this story again in that reading we had from Ephesians. But this time he's not referring to the exodus, but he's referring to the new inheritance, the new wilderness wanderings. Because Paul is seeing the church as coming out of slavery to sin through Jesus Christ to the promised land. 
So Paul talks about an inheritance. And the inheritance that he has in mind is the whole world. When it's been renewed by a fresh act of God's power and love. Therefore, those of us that know and trust in God, know and trust Jesus, we know that they're signs to the rest of the world of what is to come. We've also received the Holy Spirit, which is to the Christian and the church, the equivalent of the cloud and fire to the Israelites in the wilderness. It's that powerful, personal presence of the living God. And the Holy Spirit is far more than a leader and a guide to us. It's part of our inheritance. It's an inheritance that we don't want to transfer for money, but it's an inheritance that we want to hold on to because of the promise of what is to come. So if the Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance, I wonder why we don't always look after him or consider his presence with us every day. The Holy Spirit is what gives us the power to do the work of God for the kingdom. The Spirit is what gives us the courage to do the things we might not otherwise do. So why often do we talk about God the Father and God the Son? And God the Holy Spirit usually gets left out. Not necessarily say in this church, but as a, as a worldwide church, as a Christian movement, the Holy Spirit is often the part of the Trinity that we miss out. Yet it's part of our inheritance. It's crucial to the future and the promised land. The Holy Spirit helps us to see as God sees as well. Earlier this week, I was at St. Mary's in town at a New Wine Leaders Gathering. They'd invited uh, Blaine Cook to come and speak, who was talking to us about compassion. But not just any old compassion, but the compassion that God has for his world. Not the sense of when we go, well, something's not quite right there, and then we leave it alone and we walk the other way. But the sense that something's not right there, and something deep within our gut says, well, what can we do about it? How can we help? It's that sense of knowing that things are not as they should be. During the morning, he shared a very powerful testimony of what had happened on a recent trip to South Africa. Blaine and his team had seen lots of people healed and many come to faith in Jesus. And I'll be honest, I sat there thinking, that's a good story. I wonder how much embellishment you're putting on it. I wonder how much you're adding to this to make a point. We then moved into ministry time. The spirit turned up in power. People were healed. People were given new gifts. And I had a sense in that moment that God was saying to me, I want to challenge your unbelief because I can act like Blaine has just shared. You haven't seen this happen because you haven't been praying for the people that I'm sending to you. And that was quite powerful. I was quite perturbed by that. I'm a bit disturbed. Wendy will tell you I came back into the office and sort of had quite a long monologue with her. She, I think, bless her, she just sat there and listened to me as I just poured out this stuff and saying, well, forgive my unbelief, Lord. I then realized I, I hadn't actually gone forward for prayer that morning on Tuesday morning, which was a mistake. Because I came away from the session, as I say, having heard from God but not having prayed into that. And I started thinking, well, how often have I allowed the Holy Spirit to direct me? And how many times have I got in the way? But on Wednesday morning, I went to St. Albans, the diocesan office, for some training. As I walked from the train station in St. Albans to the diocesan office, about 15 minutes, I realized that I was seeing people with new eyes, almost with like a new vision. And as I walked, I sensed God saying to me, that person's hurting. That person's okay today. That person is hiding behind that smile. And it just kept coming as I walked past all these people as I got to the office. After the training, as I walked back, exactly the same thing happened to me. I was seeing people as God saw them. Those that were hiding their pain behind a fake smile. Those that I knew something in their life was not right. And I just said to God, well, if you want me to pray for any of these people, 
Show me who. Now, I'm not going to now come out with an amazing testimony that I prayed for ten people and they all came to know the Lord. I didn't pray for anybody. Because I didn't feel the Lord say to me, I want you to pray for that person. But when I got back to Luton, when I got off the train, the plan was to get the bus back to Bushmead. But something in me sensed I couldn't do that. So I thought, okay, well, what do you want me to do, Lord? And I sensed I needed to walk around the mount. Now, partly I was looking for lunch, but as I walked around... (laughs) Every time I got to somewhere, whether it was Burger King, KFC, whatever, all the places that do lunch, I just had a sense of the Lord saying, don't go in there. And I didn't have my lunch in the mall. I actually came and had a sandwich at home. But as I was walking around to these different places, I was praying for everybody that was in that place. And to be honest with you, by the time I'd got back to the, the, the um, as I was coming back from the other end of the mall, I was completely overwhelmed. And I knew in myself, I've got to get on the bus to get home or I'm going to be in tears. And I knew I could sense that pain and hurt, sense that people out there are so desperately seeking the truth. It didn't stop there, though. Because as I got on the bus, a group of uh, people that were with a carer got on. A group, I think it was about four or five that had Down syndrome, and they were with a carer. And my heart just wept for them. Because as we came down Old Bedford Road, one of the chaps pressed the button to ring the bell. And it was too early, but the bus driver stopped, and the carer said, oh, I'm really sorry, he, you know, he shouldn't have done that. He said, okay, don't worry. You know, bus driver said, okay, don't worry. He wasn't a grumpy bus driver, which was really fortunate because of what happened next. But he said, okay, that's fine, don't worry. So we carried on. We got to the next bus stop, and the bell wouldn't work, as you know, because if the bus hadn't actually stopped, the bell didn't work. So the carer shouts out, hang on a minute, that's our stop. So the bus driver pulls in at the next place. As he pulls in and opens the door, one of these chaps just presses the bell, and it rings. (laughs) And he looks at his carer and went, it works. And he pressed it again, and he pressed it again. And he pressed it again. And he pressed it again. They then got off the bus. And I just felt God say to me, pray for them. Because through that, as I'd seen that person press the bell and be so excited that the bell now worked, I sensed God saying to me, be like him. Be excited in the small things. Be excited in those small things that I'm doing. And I realized that God had wanted me to see the world through his eyes. To experience the compassion that God has for each and every one of us. And it made an incredible impact on me. Particularly as I've gone about the rest of the week, there's been so many things that are happening that I've really sensed God saying, showing me, this isn't right, but you can at least pray. Because some of the things, as we know, like Brexit, there's nothing we can do ourselves that will bring about a result to this. All we can do is pray. And I just had that sense that God was saying to me, you've got the Holy Spirit in you. I want you to pray. It's the very least you can do. And as you pray, then you may have those testimonies of people being healed and people coming to know me. So are we praying enough? Are we following the promptings of the Spirit? Are we misusing that inheritance that God has given us, that incredible gift because we're scared of where it's going to lead us. As Paul says, having believed, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Because we know that when we believe in the Lord, we are sealed with that promise. We receive the Holy Spirit. And through baptism, we know that we have that sign of the cross made on our forehead. It may be through water, it may be through oil. Obviously, that then goes, the water and the oil goes. But friends, that seal that you have had placed on your head is with you forever. Even now, if you've been baptized, that seal, that cross of Jesus Christ is on you. And it will never, ever leave you. Because we are forever marked out by God. 
Now, we know that having that seal on us doesn't mean that we're promised an easy life. We know that it doesn't mean everything is going to come into line and we're just going to sail through life and then get to heaven. We know that's not the case. We know that we need to keep going back to God for guidance. We need to keep going back to God for direction as we continue through the wilderness of this world. And that's why things like baptism and confirmation are so important in our discipleship journey. That we can publicly say before our friends, family, and the family of God, I believe. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son. And I believe in God the Holy Spirit. That's why it's important that when we are baptized into that family, and then as time goes on, we come to confirmation where the bishop, we kneel before the bishop and he lays his hands on us to send down your Holy Spirit on your servant, insert name. And it's an incredibly powerful moment. It's an incredibly powerful moment as you kneel before the bishop and he prays for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Of course, he's not praying for the Holy Spirit to come on you for the first time. That comes when you accept Christ. But it's just that sense of confirming what you have said. Confirming that you have made that decision to follow Jesus publicly in front of people. That's why it's so important. And it reminds us, in confirmation, we're then sealed again with the sign of a cross through oil. I can't remember what the correct term is, but it is an oil that we use. And it just reminds you that that seal that was placed on you at baptism is now placed on you again as the bishop confirms that the Holy Spirit is upon you. So Paul says, because we have our inheritance of the Lord, he's been praying and giving thanks for us all. He asked the Father to give the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Friends, the experience I had this week allowed me to see those people with God's eyes. It came on me really unexpectedly. I just thought, I'm getting it Wednesday morning, I'm going to the office for three hours of safeguarding training, I'm getting the train home, and then, great, done, dusted, that's a certificate in the filing cabinet. But no, God didn't want to just use it for that. God wanted to show me the pain and the hurt in the world. It helped me in a very small way to see more of the world as God sees but we know we don't always see with those eyes. We don't automatically see the world as God sees. And some of us will see God's power at work more often than others. Some of us might never see that supernatural power of God. It doesn't make us any less of a Christian. But I do find that the times when we see the power of God at work are very special, often very significant. When we see God on the move, When we see him working in the lives of people, it's beyond words. It's beyond anything that we can comprehend. But obviously God knows that we all see things differently. We all see different things in different people. Like this morning when Steve said, share with the person next to you a gift. I imagine you'll have have shared those gifts. If you'd have then turned around and done it to somebody on the other side of you, you'd have probably got a different gift. Because people see you differently. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ. Of course, we always look at things with different viewpoints, don't we? If you look at the picture on the screen, you may remember this a few years ago. Well, is the dress white with gold lace or blue with black lace? It's exactly the same dress, but people see it differently. And that's the same in the family of God. We see God's power at work and yet we will all see that differently. Thank you. Another example, though, is if we look out to sea. You may look out to sea. There may be some of you with a telescope and one of you without. If you're looking to see without the telescope, you're not going to see what's on the horizon. But if you're looking with that telescope, you're going to see what is there. So sometimes we don't know what is there and that's why we need each other to point these things out to us. But whichever way we look at things or see God's power, 
Paul knows we won't all automatically see it. That's why he offers this prayer. That the eyes of our heart may be enlightened in order that we may know the hope to which he has called us. Many of the things that the power of God is in us, the power of God in us, achieves remains hidden from the world. Many of those things that the power of God in us, it changes us from the inside out and it's hidden to the world. Sometimes even from our fellow brothers and sisters. Because it's the power of God that puts those secret sins to death. It's often not seen. It's the people of prayer that we become. But it's that prayer that isn't seen. It's between you and God. And maybe for you this morning, the power of God working in you is simply having the courage to get up and get out of bed. Maybe it was the fact that you came to church this morning. Maybe it's the fact that you're here and you're able to sing praise to God when we sing. God works in so many more ways than we ever know. We don't know how each of us this morning are feeling, where we are in our walk with God. Sometimes the power of God simply comes from a text message from a friend saying, I'm thinking of you today. It doesn't have to be the big supernatural events that we crave. It can be in the very, very small that God's power can be at work. Paul tells us the church is under Jesus Christ. We are his agents. We have that inheritance in us. So are we going to use that inheritance that we've been given or are we going to hold on to it? Just imagine if the worldwide church acted with the power of the Holy Spirit all the time. Wouldn't this world look different? But how often then are we simply oblivious to what God is already doing in the world? How often do we not see that God is in the world? This week I was called up to Keach Hospice to visit someone who was end of life. It's not part of this congregation or local, but I had a call saying they'd like to see a member of clergy. When I got to the hospice, I was expecting to have like one of those moments where you lead the person lying in the bed to faith. So I was all ready with, you know, make sure we had the prayers, had the right Bible reading and everything. But when I got there, this poor lady was too ill to speak. She was fast asleep, had been asleep for about four or five days. But her sister was there with her. And after a while talking, I discovered that both the lady in the bed and the sister were Christians. And I was told that the lady who was, who was dying would have said the Lord's Prayer every night and would always pray for her family. Her sister had been a PCC member for 15 years and had recently stood down. And as we talked, we would say it was really obvious that we were both thinking the same thing, that we get so wrapped up in our lives, sometimes even in church business, that we actually miss what God is doing. And some of the things that have been happening as we've been preparing um, things through PCC, we've been praying and we've not been, seeing, we've not been seeing results. But that doesn't mean that God is not there. God is still working in that. God can still work even when we don't see it. Dean reminded me, I shared a song last week, I think it was at Intercessors or PCC, um, called Waymaker. And at the end, the, the worship leader goes off a little bit from, the, from the, the lyrics and says, even though we don't see you moving, you're still working, or words to that effect. So even though we might have come to church today, we might not feel that we've encountered God, we might not feel we've been touched by the Holy Spirit today, trust me, God has still done some work. You will be different having come to church. This, the encounter you have today will make you a different person. You might not feel it, but that's the power of God at work in you. Of course, you may go out the door completely different, completely transformed with whatever it is that you came to church with. But even if you don't feel God at work, he is still there. Often we go about things in such a rush that we miss the small things of God. I wonder if I was to ask you, how many of you saw a miracle on your way to church this morning? I bet not many of you would put your hands up. If you were like me, you'd have realized it was 10 to 10 and I needed to be over here. 
So I quickly ran across, the, I ran across the road, making sure it was clear. I ran across the road and came to church. But what if I'd have left those five minutes earlier and just walked slowly? What would I have seen God doing? I know I'm only there, but I'm sure I would have seen God at work in that little walk that I made to church. So the inheritance that we have, that Holy Spirit, is a sure and certain hope of what is to come when we get to eternity. Going back to the lady, I was asked to anoint her. And as I did, I anointed her with oil. I just put the sign of the cross on her forehead. I sensed God saying to her, through me, well done, my good and faithful servant. And there was an incredible sense of peace that then fell on that room. And after we prayed, the lady's sister said, wow, there's a real sense of peace. We both felt it. That was the power of God present with all of us. Now, I don't know these two people, but it was an incredibly precious moment and one that I will certainly treasure. Despite not knowing the lady other than her name and what I'd been told about her, I knew that she was still my sister in Christ and that soon she would know far more about Jesus than any of us will this side of heaven. And that was really powerful. It got me thinking on the way back, well, what about all the questions that I've got? I wonder when I get there, will I ask God all these different questions about, well, why did this happen? Why do you allow suffering? Why is there evil in the world? But I imagine when we get to heaven, those questions will just fall away because we'll be in the glory of the Lord. We will be with him as it's meant to be. It reminds us that the kingdom is, the, is in the now and the not yet. That we, have, so we see some of the kingdom now in the everyday. We see God at work, but we know it's in the not yet as well. Because we might see people healed, but for every person we see healed, there's usually a good number that aren't healed. And it's important because I don't think that's said enough in churches or in these big conferences when they're talking about healing. How often do we hear about those people that haven't received healing? It doesn't mean that they're not loved by God as much as the person who has been healed. We don't know why. We just call to pray. So how then? We've been looking at different things. How do we start to see things differently? Well, Paul gives us that answer in verse 17. I've mentioned it already. It's that fresh gift of wisdom and revelation. It's not a one-time thing that we get this gift of wisdom and revelation and then for the next 20 years we're fine. It's an ongoing thing that we need to keep asking God for, a fresh revelation, fresh wisdom to see things as he does. We need to be asking God to show us the things that he's doing in the world, to ask God to open our eyes. If we continually pray for that wisdom and revelation, then we will start to see the supernatural power of God, I'm sure. We will start to see signs and wonders. But we can't strive for those things. That's not the end goal. We're not aiming for those. We are aiming for a heart that loves God. Those things come as an outworking of hearts that are in love with God. But as we go about with that wisdom and revelation that Paul talks about, that's when we'll find those opportunities to pray. Those opportunities for God to do his mighty acts. It's one of the things I love about new wine when I go I know that God's going to turn up and act. I know that there's going to be ministry happening. I know that people are going to be healed, that people are going to be set free, that people are going to come to know the Lord for the first time. It's a real opportunity for faith to be built up. And I usually come away absolutely on fire for God. But that's just two weeks of the year. And I'm only there for one of those weeks usually. So what about the other 50 weeks? What about the other 51 weeks? Where do we see God at work in such a mighty way? It should be in the church. It should be through the outworking of us as Christians, as his disciples, with the inheritance of the Holy Spirit, being able to pray for people, seeing things happen, seeing lives transformed. It doesn't come through the big-name speakers. That's what I've come to learn this week really powerfully. Because if we're not careful, when we, look, when we go for the big-name speakers, it becomes idolatry. And it's not about that. It's about serving God with all of our heart, and seeing how he is going to work through us to bring about transformation. So 
Because over the past week, as I've been chatting to people, the same topic seems to keep coming up. That God already is transforming lives. Of course he is. That's who God is. That's the God we serve. But it's through speaking to those different people, I've been made aware of more and more things that are happening. If we scratch beneath the headlines of the news, we can see God at work. We can see that God is already on the move. You may have heard that Kanye West has turned to Christ. Huge pop star, a rap artist. <laughs> that says it all, Betty. <laughs> Thank you. That, that says it all, that somebody like that, so anti-Jesus, anti-church, he's gone from saying, I am king, to Jesus is Lord. And his latest album is called Jesus is King, which includes gospel tracks. Now there's many that are skeptical of this, wondering if what he's saying and doing is just simply a PR stunt. But he said in the media that he won't sing his old songs again because they contain profanities. He won't sing his old songs that are very different that basically go against what the church and Jesus teaches. So if he has truly come to know Jesus Christ, it's not for us to question, it's not for us to judge him. It's for us to say, if he's proclaiming it, we know we can only say Jesus is Lord with the Holy Spirit in us. So if he's saying Jesus is Lord, we should be celebrating this. I looked at Twitter this morning. He has 29.3 million followers on Twitter. And right through his Twitter feed, he's saying Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. That is God at work. And even if we're not sure if he has fully committed, fully converted, he's still preaching Jesus is Lord. And there's 29.3 million people who are still going to see those messages. And I think, thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. But I've also read that Kanye West has said this week, what have you been hearing from Christians? They'll be the first ones to judge me. That's not right. Something's not right with that statement, is it? But we mostly know it's true. Because my first thought was, I wonder if he's really, really converted. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord, for my unbelief. But God can transform anyone. If he can transform somebody like Kanye West... He can transform anybody. And a quote that I saw about this is, if your God can't save Kanye, then your God is too small. If your God can't save Kanye, your God is too small. So have we made God too small? Have we made him so that these people can't? We don't think these people that are big pop stars can actually come to know Jesus. Because there's not just Kanye West, there's many other stars that are now coming out, not just in the last two weeks, but there's many other stars that are saying that they are Christian. They're no longer keeping it hidden. The other year in an award ceremony, Chris Pratt, an actor, he was on stage collecting awards and standing there and saying, it's because of God that I'm receiving this award. He preached a message to millions of people that night. Millions of people heard it. Letitia Wright, another actress from Marvel, she put an article out yesterday saying that the journalist had edited out every mention of God in her interview. And she sort of little little ridicule of them on Twitter. I can't remember how it was worded, but I just thought, that's really sad that the journalists are not acknowledging that Jesus is Lord and that Jesus is doing work in people of power, in people that have an impact, in people that are able to share the gospel message with millions of people. It's something we should be celebrating rather than thinking, well, is it true, is it not? Because it's clear that God's doing something on the world stage. So how many of us, me included here, are sitting idly by thinking, well, some of it's probably a PR stunt. These celebrities that are from a world of sex, drugs, alcohol, money, and fame, that's touted as success. These celebrities in that world are showing that God can move and transform, that nobody is too far from God. It's not just the music industry. It's Hollywood. There's films all over the place at the moment that have an explicitly Christian message. 
Over the past few years, we've had Courageous, Facing the Giants, War Room, Do You Believe, The Case for Christ, Heaven is for Real, God's Not Dead, One, Two, and Three, Paul, Apostle of Christ, Mary Magdalene, and the list goes on. Amanda and I were watching telly last night, and I saw an actor, went on IMDb like you do on your phone, and there's about another five films that he's in that are all sharing the gospel, that are in production. But it's not just coming from Christian companies. It's coming from the big companies like Sony, Universal, and Paramount. The big names in the media industry are spreading the gospel. And that is a cause for celebration. That's the world stage. But what about within our community? Even within our communities, friends, there is a hunger for the story of God to be heard once more. There is hunger to receive the power of God for us to share our inheritance of the Holy Spirit with those whom we encounter. When we heard the truth and came to know Jesus, we received that seal. We received the Holy Spirit. That power of God is at work today on the big stage and on the little stage. The Holy Spirit is, of course, in each and every one of us. He is our inheritance. So can I encourage you this week, as you go about... Take time to slow down from the busyness of life, from the busyness of the world. Take in what you see around you. Spend time in the word. Spend time in prayer. See what God is saying to you. Ask God to give you eyes to see like he sees. Ask God to show you where he is in the everyday. That in those small walks, even if it's from church house to hear that you would see a miracle because I think our eyes will be opened in a massive way as we walk or run or whatever we do seek God in what we're doing seek God in all that we do as you come forward for communion this morning to receive bread and wine ask God to remind you that his power, his Holy Spirit lives in each and every one of you that he will show up. He does act. So even though we may be looking at the world, let's not miss out on what God is doing in the here and the now. Because we we can't miss out on it. God is such a big God, such a mighty God, we can't put him in a box. But we can share him with those that we see. We can see the power of God at work in lives. We can see lives transformed. We can have those testimonies that these big name speakers have. As God said to me, you're not seeing them because you're not praying enough. So are you going to pray for those people you encounter this week? I want to give some space for any of you who'd like to receive prayer. I think we're going to move into communion first. And as I say, as you come forward to receive the bread and wine, hear God say to you, my Holy Spirit is in you. I've transformed your life. Hear that message. And if you'd like to receive specific prayer at the end of the service, and do find one of us, be a few of us up at the front. And I encourage you, if you feel God saying to you, You need to get prayer. Don't leave this place without doing so. In many ways, it is a big step of faith and courage to come up to receive prayer. I've been there myself. I struggle at New Wine to go forward for prayer. I said to you earlier, I didn't go forward on Tuesday. But I urge you, if you sense God prompting you to receive prayer, then come forward. Take that step of faith. Because if you don't, Are you missing out on something that God wants to do? Amen.